Good morning, GFA. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are and whenever you are. I'm going to talk to you today about vibrato, and I'm going to do that by asking and then answering a series of questions. So the first question, why do we use vibrato? I'm going to answer that mostly with a quotation. Uh, this is from William Kincaid. Uh, he was the principal flute of the Philadelphia Orchestra for 40 years and taught at the Curtis Institute. Uh, this quote comes from a book called Kincaidiana, Flute Player's Handbook by John Crowell, who was a student of Kincaid. Kincaid says, Vibrato is a wonderfully expressive tool when used with taste and discretion, the frosting on the cake. It adds a lyrical quality and an element of freedom to the flow of the sound. As guitarists, I think it's also important to remember that it's pretty much the only thing we can do to a note after we hit it, other than stop the note. But that's a whole nother can of worms. We're not going to open that one today. So, what is vibrato? Vibrato is rhythmic variation of the frequency and amplitude of pitch. It's a natural phenomenon that occurs in voice production uh, related to a muscular tremor and that's related, so it seems, to tonus, which is low-level neurological activity uh, that maintains a steady state or a readiness in our muscles. Now this tonus uh, occurs at a rate of five to seven hertz, or five to seven times per second. We'll get back to that uh, rather significant number later. I think it's important not to forget that vibrato comes directly from the voice, the, the primary instrument, the original instrument. In so much music, we're striving to imitate the expressive qualities of the human voice, so always keep that in mind. In the case of most instruments, uh, the technique of vibrato seems to take on a life of its own, and the vibrato for that instrument develops accordingly. But I think it's helpful to start with the origins of the thing in singing. So vibrato is a topic of some controversy, uh, as an expressive tool has been used since the Renaissance, each subsequent generation seems to disagree on how much um, and uh, how often it should be deployed. Even as long ago as 1751, uh, Giminiani advocated for its use, saying it is art of playing on the violin. Uh, when it is made on short notes, it only contributes to make their sound more agreeable. And for this reason, it should be made use of as often as possible. Uh, in that book, he also suggests some uh, expressive qualities that vibrato may lend to notes that I think are very helpful to consider. Uh, he uses words like majesty, dignity, uh, affliction, or fear. I'm also going to quote another violinist, uh, this time a much more contemporary source. Uh, this is from Simon Fisher. Simon says that vibrato is the quiver of emotion in the singing voice of a string instrument. The vibrato throb can be like the sound and physical feeling of crying, which curiously is often identical to that of laughing. This makes vibrato sometimes joyous, sometimes sorrowful, often both at the same time. If you try to vibrate only as a physical action, it is never the same as when you picture its expressiveness or color and let it happen by itself. If you try to vibrate fast, the action may seem tiring. If instead you direct only one or two things, such as to keep it narrow or to free the left upper arm, meanwhile you picture its expressiveness or color and truly listen, you will find the vibrato playing itself and working quite differently. This is a great example of how in the end fine techniques come from musical imagination and expression rather than music somehow coming out of mechanical technique, which it can't. So I like to think of vibrato as a way to highlight notes, uh, to shine a light on them, add some special source, or just a sprinkling of fairy dust, uh, however you want to think about it. The fluctuations in pitch are small enough that the note itself seems to literally vibrate rather than actually move or change pitch. And some words that I think are helpful to consider are the note is quivering or undulating or shimmering. So one of the many problems with vibrato, perhaps like many expressive tools, is that, uh, and this is pointed out by Kincaid in his book, he says that many players claim vibrato occurs like spontaneous combustion, or that an angel kisses you on the forehead and suddenly there is vibrato. Um, and I think that to some extent it is intuitive, 
Uh, and for many players, it evolves naturally, uh, probably through imitation. Um, and I encourage you to listen to good vibrato as often as you can. Um, again, I like to start with The Voice, two of my favorite singers, uh, Beatrice Fisher, Discal, Dawn Upshore. Uh, I feel like their uh, musical expressivity has been very uh, significant in my development. Um, you can start listening to them. You can find your own, of course. Now, since it is such a personal thing, people are often evasive and mysterious about it and reluctant to commit to a specific formula. But that's apparently what I signed up to do for you today. So here we go. Like bowed string instruments, we have to change the length of the string, something that they can do simply by moving their finger. Uh, so if they move their finger back, essentially the string gets longer, so the note goes flatter. But because of the frets on the guitar, uh, they fix the vibrating length of the string. We actually actually have to change the tension of the string. So we have to push it along its length, pull it back, push it. The string goes slack, so the pitch goes down, pull it, pitch goes up, note goes sharp. Um, this is a good opportunity to have a quick note on uh, sideways vibrato, rock vibrato. Uh, never do it. Pitch can only go sharp when you do that kind of vibrato, and that's a bad thing, right? So when you bend the string, the pitch is up. There's no uh, part of the pitch that drops below the fundamental. Um, now, I've read and I've heard plenty about using that kind of vibrato in special situations on the classical guitar, and you should consider everything you hear said about it judiciously, um, but just keep it in the back of your mind. Never do it. Uh, let's talk about the basic motion of vibrato and uh, a couple of good analogies that I've come across talking to people reading books. Um, one of them is the idea that you're shaking dice, like you're going to throw some dice playing a game, so you're shaking the dice, or that you're shaking a drink. I think the reference I read was a bottle of orange juice, but you can think of it as a cocktail shaker or whatever you like. So that motion is basically upper arm rotation and it's sort of pivoting around the elbow. And uh, another useful exercise, I think, to try to visualize physically how this vibrato works um, is to take your left hand fingers, put them on your right hand, and then try to get that motion going, okay? So don't squeeze with your thumb. Your thumb can be there in the palm of your hand just to balance your hand, but you're not squeezing. So the fingers are pressing on the skin. You can feel the tug of the skin. Try to keep the motion easy and relaxed. And it should feel like the motion almost sustains itself, right? The arm muscles should jiggle a little bit. Uh, if they're not jiggling, maybe you're spending too much time in the gym or maybe not enough time in the gym. I don't know, one of those two. Um, so very little pressure with the thumb, just feeling that skin move, okay? Now we're gonna try doing this on the guitar. I think, uh, it's a good place to start around the seventh position. So the string tension reduces as you get closer to the 12th fret. That's where the string tension is the lowest. So if we're gonna try to manipulate the string, then somewhere where the tension is low is helpful. So if we go to seventh position, uh, I wanna start with my third finger, which is sort of the middle of my hand. And I'm gonna start on the third string, which is pretty much the middle of the finger. So, Try playing that note and then trying to get that same movement that you had before on your hand. And don't worry about what it really sounds like. Just try to hear that change in pitch. Okay? You can try moving it even more seriously. See how much you can vary that pitch. You can get almost half step, quarter tone. If you use more thumb, then that allows you to put more pressure on the string, but it generally tends to restrict the motion of the arm, right? It starts to get locked. You get this kind of spasmodic motion. Uh, you wanna try to use your arm weight and the force of gravity to press down on the note, right? You can actually do it without your thumb, and it's a good idea to take your thumb off and see how that movement feels, right? Should be, with any luck, pretty. 
if you're having trouble getting that movement going, um, maybe one little trick that you can try is with your third finger on the ninth fret, keep your thumb in the same place and just slide your finger to the tenth fret, keeping your thumb in the same place, right? Then slide back, trying to make it legato. So it's like you're in one place, then you're in the other. So we don't really hear the journey, we don't hear the change. So it's a quick impulse in the motion. Now make the same motion, but just don't change the fret. So it's really like a shift that stays in place. So that's the impulse, and that sets the rocking motion going. So once we've done that on the third string, uh, which is maybe my favorite string for vibrato, I don't know, everybody has a favorite, uh, like the third string. Um, try moving to the fourth string, same fret, same finger, and you'll notice that the string, uh, the bass strings, because they're wound, you get more grip on the string. So the finger will move that string more easily. Lots of people suggest that you start with the bass string because it's whole, probably a little bit easier. So you'll get more fluctuation with probably less effort. You can try the fifth string. Changes a little bit. String is thicker. And then sixth string. If you use the same amount of pressure on the sixth string, you probably get greater fluctuation because the tension of the string is lower, generally. So each of these strings have a different feel. You can go up to the second string, and then eventually the first string. Unfortunately, the first string is probably the hardest to vibrate. It's very thin, it's hard to get a good grip on it. Um, tension is quite high, but trying to get that easy motion going and listening to the way that that pitch fluctuates. So, trying to keep in mind this idea that the note is shimmering. Okay, let's go back to some uh, boring details. Maybe not boring, but uh, they are a bit detail -y. Um, so there's been a couple of studies of, uh, well, a study of vocal music, um, uh, which I think is very interesting. They took some recordings, several professional recordings of Schubert's Ave Maria and measured the vibrato um, in 30 different professional singers. Uh, there was a lot of variety, um, but the average was around 70 cents. Okay, remember there's 100 cents um, in a uh, half step. So that average span is pretty close to a half step, like almost a quarter tone flat, quarter tone sharp, okay? Um, another study that was to do with uh, high school and college instrumentalists showed that a deviation of 12 cents, which is pretty small relative to that vibrato, um, 12 cents amounted to the note being out of tune. So the perception when you hear it 12 cents off is out of tune. A couple of cents, most people can't really tell the difference. Once you start hitting around 12, then it starts to feel a little bit out of tune. So I feel like the extent of good vocal vibrato, which is pretty wide, when you do that on an instrument, it just tends to sound a little bit too much. Um, on the guitar, there are some limitations to the extent that we can maintain kind of a even balance of vibrato. Um, so what I'm gonna do is try to prescribe sort of like a standard deviation on the guitar. Um, and I'm gonna suggest that we shoot for around plus or minus 10 cents as a baseline guide. Um, if you're in any doubt about how much 10 cents is, you can uh, actually use a tuner. So a lot of tuners will have some um, function of telling you how many cents you're sharp or flat. And you can literally sit there, watch the tuner, find out what plus or minus 10 cents feels like, and then try to get used to that, that feeling, right? A lot of woodwind and brass players do that. Um, I think maybe string players too, but the, you know, the easy thing for them is that they can sustain a note so they can bend it down and really hold that pitch because our guitar is uh, um, decaying so quickly. Uh, it's much more difficult. You have to keep hitting the string, but still trying to get a sense for what that fluctuation in the pitch feels like. Um, go back over the six strings, um, practice that little deviation, and then start using other fingers. So second finger, I think also is pretty good. Third finger is my favorite, but second string is pretty, second finger is pretty good. Also kind of the middle of the hand, so that 
rocking motion should feel fairly easy. First finger, it's a pretty strong finger, but it's on the side of the hand, so it feels a little bit, a little bit less easy for me. Um, fourth finger, lots of people feel like the fourth finger is not so good because it's weak, but for me it feels like I've got the rest of the hand behind it, weirdly, in a way that uh, don't feel that with the first finger. But the fourth finger, you can use the support of the hand to add to that vibration. Pitch is perceived as being the top of the vibrato. Or is it the middle of the vibrato? I don't know. You ask a lot of people, you get a lot of different answers. Um, I think in general, it seems that consensus is that pitch is the middle of the vibrato. So then we have an issue of sharp and flat. Do you go down first? Do you go up first, sharp first, flat first? And I'm gonna answer that question for you. You go down, flat first, go back up. Remember where you heard it. There's two reasons why I think we should do that. Uh, on the guitar, it's easier to pull a note sharp, so you can get a lot of deviation sharp. It's much harder to get that same degree of deviation when you go flat. So I think if we're heading flat, that will sort of mitigate the tendency to go sharp. Um, and then the other point is that I just think it sounds better. So almost always, almost always, very occasionally, maybe not, but we'll get back to that point later. So when you're doing this vibrato, Try to think of it as one motion and the rebound. So another analogy, and this is a, another Simon Fisher one, is to think about it like clapping, right? When you clap, right, that motion, your hands are just going in, 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 right? You're not thinking in, out, in, out, in, out, <laughs> right? So it's one motion and then the rebound, okay? And I think the rebound is a very helpful way to think about it, that we impulse and come back. And as you come back, you'll hear that sharp component without actually having to try to make it happen. I think in general, if you're trying to make it happen, you'll just end up with too much of it. Okay. So the rate of fluctuation. Uh, in order to work on this, I'm going to suggest that we go to the ninth position. And once you're up there, as you move your hand, you're going to hit the guitar, right? Your hand will bang against the guitar. You can hear that contact point. Um, then get your trusty old metronome out. And I would suggest that you start with a rate of quarter note equals 60. And just very slowly, just doing one per beat. So, oops, I <laughs> have wrong string. You can hear that variation. Then do two, three, four. That <laughs> starts to feel a little bit mechanical, okay? Practice that with all the fingers. Okay, it's hard to get away from that sort of mechanical feeling, but it's a place to start. Now studies of vocal vibrato have shown that uh, vibrato rates in singers are in the range of five to seven hertz, five to seven times per second. There's that connection back to that uh, back of the brain tonus thing. And five to seven hertz, five to seven times per second, that translates to four fluctuations per beat, per beat at uh, around 76. So that's 76. So you can hear those little contacts right up to 104. Pretty fast. to sound almost like giggling. So that's a pretty intense sort of 
high end of the range. So now I'm just going to talk about vibrato as release. Um, I think this is a very important point, something that I don't remember being taught at any point, but uh, it's always something that I've thought about and I try to convey it in my teaching. Um, and virtually every instrumentalist I talk to about vibrato, string players, wind players, brass players, guitarists, uh, almost everybody mentioned this idea of vibrato as a release being a thing. So pretty sure it's a thing. So we should talk about it. Um, now it may seem counterintuitive to use an active motion um, to represent release, but it's the lightness of touch and the ease of motion that achieves this. So the final note of a grouping, if you think of that kind of motion, that kind of motion. So there's a burst of energy and then the last note is the release of that energy, it's the peak. And as you reach that point, there is a physical release. So practicing little groups of notes, right? We often do kind of speed bursts, little groups of three, groups of five, seven, all sorts of different kinds of groups, moving from strong beat to weak beat, so on. Um, and feeling like that last note not only is the end of the group, but it's also a musically expressive moment, okay? So try to get this sensation that as you reach that point, there is a release. Um, now I think this release idea is also very helpful uh, in maintaining legato when you're shifting. So the muscle movement of the vibrato can help to loosen up the arm, and as you shift, then it sort of like, it's an anticipation of the motion. Um, so it allows the release of the note to be a little bit smoother, right? There was a little bit of a glissando in there. But as I release the note, I'm not, I'm not kind of cutting it off. And there's an interesting thing, when we play a note, when it decays, as long as we don't actually hear it stop, then we still think that it's there. So if the, the note decays, we can't really hear it anymore, we still sense that it's there. If I hear it cut off, then I know it's gone. So if I can use that vibrato, it helps to allow the note to kind of sit in the air and sing. And also as the release happens, it tends to make the release much smoother. So there isn't this feeling of immediate end of the note. We're just talking about decay. Talk a little bit about continuous vibrato. So this is, uh, uh, again, a, a topic of some controversy. Um, and it was first advocated by Gimignani back in the Baroque, but generations since then have uh, talked about and disagreed with this idea of using continuous vibrato. Uh, I think it's most common in violinists. Heifetz certainly was a sort of big advocate of this continuous vibrato. Uh, Isai before him. Um, but then there's also been great players. Joachim was dead against continuous vibrato. Um, now, for us, I think it's helpful to try to strive for a sense of continuous vibrato. There's a couple of reasons for that. In addition to the physical benefits of that release that we're feeling um, to just minimize general tension in the hand and certainly minimize the buildup of tension, um, and in order to create a general character of cantabile in our playing, right? It's very hard to play legato. If we have that cantabile sense, then it's much easier to create that uh, illusion of legato sometimes, or even true legato. So I'm going to advocate for a sense of continuous vibrato. I say sense because, like I say, we can't literally use continuous vibrato, um, but we can develop an ability to play continuous vibrato, and from that, uh, I feel like it's almost a willingness for the fingers to adopt vibrato, like the whole arm really, um, so that it becomes an instinctive action uh, and then it's just an intrinsic part of our mechanism. So we're doing it, um, we are aware that we're doing it, but we're not forcing ourselves to do it. Um, so to practice this at first, I would suggest you use simple chromatic figures. 
Um, so for it to be continuous, it's important to maintain the vibrato while you change fingers, right? <laughs> so easy right um, often people when they're starting vibrato they'll get a nice vibrato going then it'll stop next note stop next note stop so as you're changing fingers trying to keep that motion going so that's a little bit tricky but uh, also something that you should definitely work on bear in mind that while we pretty much never play a musical line like this right four chromatic notes in a row this exercise is intended to just develop this sort of natural instinct in your hand for a general application of vibrato. Um, melodic lines typically diatonic, they're mixtures of whole and half steps, there's skips, changing strings, um, changes in rhythmic value, um, sometimes those are notated rhythmic values, right? We're switching from eighth notes to quarter notes or something, um, but it might also be uh, an expressive interpretive choice uh, that we're going to manipulate the rhythm a little bit in order to give some notes more time. So the intensity of notes within a phrase can be more or less accented with vibrato in the same way that we use dynamics and rhythm to shape a phrase. I'm going to quote uh, Kincaid again, uh, and he says that a note can be made to travel by letting the vibrato evolve in speed, amplitude, and timbre as the intensity increases, like a flower blossoming. Conversely, one can shift down and dissolve into a straight sound and a diminuendo cadence. So remember that Kincaid is talking about the flute, um, and as with other sustaining instruments, they have the ability to sustain long notes and they can do all sorts of things to the notes while they're sustaining. And that's a luxury that we're denied on the guitar. But what I'm gonna suggest is that we take the gist of Kincaid's direction um, and we can apply it to a short melodic idea. So uh, I'm gonna take just a little excerpt from uh, Torva's uh, Nocturno the beginning of that. That's it, just a series of eighth notes, right? But uh, rather than playing them right in time, kind of boring. So if I have some vibrato, I can also have a little crescendo, a little accelerando. Maybe the most vibrato is on that peak. And then dissipating down, right? I could do Kincaid's thing of going down to nothing, just a straight tone, or I could intensify that last note. So in conclusion, I'm going to leave you with a couple of quotes. I think they're uh, great food for thought. So the first one is from Kincaid again. He says, uh, applied intelligently, it becomes a very distinctive and individual part of the player's expressive resources. The conscientious musician will analyze, practice, and develop a repertoire of vibrato speeds, contours, amplitudes, and pitch variations, each style subject to the implications of the music being performed. Uh, and then I'm going to give you a couple of words from uh, Joachim. So he was a violinist at the end of the 19th century, contemporary of Brahms, and Brahms loved his playing. Um, and so this is a letter that he sent to uh, a young virtuoso uh, that he met right at the end of his life. It's a very short letter about violin playing in general called The Rules of Violin Playing. I'm just going to quote a couple, of, uh, a couple of these very pertinent pieces of advice. Listen carefully when practicing so that not a single note should pass by unnoticed. Be your own teacher. Only use the vibrato when you wish to lay particular stress on a note, which your feelings will suggest. And last but not least, loud playing and quick playing alone cannot do it. At most, it only dazzles the ignorant in the audience. All depends upon beautiful playing and distinctive playing. All right, thank you for listening and watching. Uh, I'm gonna leave you with a little piece uh, that hopefully illustrates some of what I've been talking about. And I hope we'll give you a little spiritual 
sustenance in these troubling times. Thank you.